Welcome to our Columbia Business School Executive Education session today. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Mark Roberts, Senior Associate Dean, and I'm really pleased to be here with Professor Bernd Schmidt and Professor Marcus Giesler for this webinar on customer experience in the digital age. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Bernd Schmidt. Uh, Bernd, hi Bernd. Bernd is a Professor of International Business and Faculty Director of the Center on Global Brand Leadership here at Columbia Business School. He's published in academic marketing journals and consulted in various industries globally on experience, brands, and innovation. He's written nine books, which have been translated into no less than 25 languages, and these include experiential marketing, customer experience management, and happy customers everywhere. Good to be here. Thanks, Bernd. Marcus Giesler is also joining us. So Marcus is a, hi Marcus. Marcus is a professor of marketing at York University's Schoolich School of Business in Toronto. And there he created customer experience design, which was the first MBA course on the subject worldwide. Marcus is a globally recognized authority on consumer culture and one of the best recognized experts studying high technology consumer behavior, according to Wired. So really a warm welcome to you both. Thank you for your time. And if it's okay with you, we'll just delve straight into your world of customer experience or, or CX. So Bernd and Marcus, first of all, um, you know, I'd like to kick off with quite a general question, I guess, but you've both worked with businesses on CX for more than 25 years. Um, from, from your perspectives, how can a company create a great customer experience? And to start us off, could each of you share perhaps an example with us? Yeah, um, my example is, is Starbucks, <clears throat> and I chose Starbucks because I'm sure everybody on this webinar has been to a Starbucks and thus has a personal experience with that brand. And it's really an amazing company. I've featured the company uh, several times in my books. Um, they obviously created an entirely new coffee experience um, in the you know late 80s, 1990s. Uh, but it's continuing to be an innovative company. <clears throat> so when you're thinking about it, they've had a lot of competitive challenges over the years. And um, the latest is sort of the entire cultural movement that you could call the hipster coffee movement, right? Um, and they are always coming back. They're always improving. They're always innovating. And I think the latest is the, is the Starbucks Reserve. Uh, I'm sure some of you have been to that one as well. They're not just serving coffee. They are creating an entire experience about coffee making all sorts of merchandise you can find there. You can even get drinks there. Uh, so they're they are reaching out. And, and in fact, there's even a restaurant here in New York in the in the Empire State Building the other day when I passed by. I, I noticed that they even have a restaurant. So I think that is a great uh, a brand and we can learn a lot from this from this classic of uh, customer experience. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Bert. That's a good start. And then Marcus, what about what about your perspective? Um, thanks, Mark. My favorite example would be a small company called Ecobee, uh, recently acquired by Janrec, um, now uh, like a really kind of number two leader in the category of smart home thermostats, a category that is not easy, very complicated, dominated by Google, and a company that didn't have a lot of budget to kind of make itself known, so low brand awareness in a complicated sort of product. A case. What they did is they um, they found a way to sort of like shift from a capabilities based approach to an experience based approach, and uh, did this on a relatively small budget of maybe no more than three hundred thousand um, dollars, and they they became um, you know the customer experience that enables planet positive action. Uh, so eco B thermostats are not really about warming your home, but about saving your planet. I find that a pretty remarkable pivot. Um, now, Ecobee is number two market leader, and it had uh, it has seen uh, last year a 15 times growth in sales. Um, it has uh, pushed away a Honeywell, and it can compete successfully against Google. And I think that is because of a customer experience design approach that we hopefully can unpack today. And uh, I guess uh, there are numerous other examples that we could give. Um, Apple is, of course, another uh, classic, but I didn't want to use Apple because there may be some users here you are using uh, Samsung. I didn't want to step on their on, on their toes. <laughs> but um, I think what what is in common in a great customer experience are three things. <clears throat> Number one, customer centricity, uh, really understanding <clears throat> what customers want, 
than what they want today. I mean, the example that Marcus gave, I think, is about uh, environmental concerns that that people have nowadays, and and you need to you need to capitalize on these sorts of trends and understand, you know, customers deep down. So that is the idea of the customer centricity. Another key thing is really to have a strategy, a CX strategy, a customer experience strategy, and that means you need to sort of plan what the experience should be and how you are going to deliver that particular kind of experience that you want your customers to have. And the third component is really the idea of creating an integrated experience, designing, implementing the strategy in an integrated fashion. So at every touch point that uh, you have with customers, you need to make sure that they are having a great experience. So those are the three things, you know, customer centricity, the, having a strategy and then integrating it uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a powerful, consistent way. So, Bernd, if we take those three things, so I think you're saying customer centricity, having a specific CX strategy and designing this integrated experience. Um, why do you feel or why is it that it's, it seems so hard for companies to create a really strong and compelling experience? And I'm thinking about many of our participants tell us that they feel that in general, customer experience seems to be getting often it feels like it's getting worse and not better. Um, and they're thinking about hotels. They talk about airlines. They talk about retail, for example. So why is that? And what do you feel that companies can do you know, to turn this feeling around from the consumer perspective? Right. Um, I also read through these questions that we got from the from the participants in this webinar, mm. and and you're absolutely right. I mean, they were saying the experience is getting worse and worse and worse, and uh, and they gave examples from hotels and from airlines and, and and from retail. So and 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 I think what these three have in common is actually um, that these businesses have have trouble finding people, and and, and keeping them, especially after after COVID. Um, you need to also train your people. They need to understand that they are supposed to pay attention to the customer and the customer's needs. They need to understand the strategy that the company has, and they need to also know at every touch point how to interact with customers so that you get this integrated experience that we were talking about. So so, so what do you do? Well, if you can't find the right people, if it's, if, if it's really difficult, well, one, one approach might be to uh, have people, but also really have technology that provides, for example, the services that you have to provide in hotels and airlines and, and, and retail. And I think we are seeing more and more of the integration of uh, digital services in hotels, for example. When you go to a hotel nowadays, it's not that you have to pick up the phone and you have to call you know, housekeeping or, or, the, or the front desk or, or the concierge or something like this. You can do a lot of this via WhatsApp or WeChat. Uh, so I think that is one approach. There can be an even more radical approach, which is to take the people out uh, I was in Asia recently in, in several countries, and you encounter more and more robots in hotels. Uh, they are doing the service delivery, so it's not the people. And that had to do with the fact that during, during COVID, we did not want to have these interactions with people. So there are a lot of uh, innovative digital uh, solutions coming for these, for these problems and for these complaints that customers have about uh, the fact that customer experience you know, is getting worse. Yeah, th thanks, Bernard. And Marcus, maybe you could build on 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 this a little bit and um, help us understand which company or companies you believe create a really great experience in what is well, it's our age, you know, the digital age. And what what can we learn from these companies? Maybe absolutely, Mark. Um, here's an interesting observation: the companies that bemoan a lack of customer experience quality or you know customer experience going down are often data driven companies have you noticed that it's very interesting that you know data is very much the central focus of a lot of companies including airlines including hospitality um i want us to think a little bit about the relationship between data and experience there is a sort of synergistic relationship between the two if you do it well and a parasitic relationship if you don't do it well data is something companies take OK, we need that in order to succeed in today's marketplace, of course. But, you know, we need to give something in exchange and that which we give in exchange ideally is an experience. And the experience is hopefully greater than the sum of its parts. It's that which, you know, makes customers want to come back. It's that which keeps the consumers engaged. So if that experience is really top notch, then data is given then data you know, is, is given by consumers. So we can think about this in terms of a data experience symmetry, if you will. M many companies find it difficult to kind of think about uh, experience design in terms of that symmetry because they're either too hung up on data 
or they're too hung up on, on experience. I think one goal that I see um, in my work with companies and my students is that we need to bring these two worlds together, you know, so that data is taken, experience is given, and that transaction needs to be a balanced one. And I think companies find that hard to do, and it's really an, an art and a science to kind of balance that out effectively. Great, thank you. And um, if I can kind of broaden the discussion a bit, Bernd, you mentioned that we did kind of diligently go through a lot of the questions that that we received before the bit, bit before the session started. Um, there was one question that seems to come up many, many times. Uh, and Bernd, how do we measure CX? And what do you believe are the most important KPIs? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> there are numerous measures for CX. <clears throat> Depends on which aspect of the customer experience you, you want to measure. If you are talking about product design and the user interface, the user experience, uh, then there are specific, uh, very tangible measures with respect to the features that, for example, a particular product has and that you have to test and also how people are interacting with that product. Uh, I, I mean, I've worked with with companies in, in, in the smartphone business and, and, and that's what they are doing on an ongoing basis, right? Testing the features, how the, but also how the, how the phone, for example, feels in your hands and, and the in all the interactive components that you nowadays have in the phones. So that would be the user experience. <clears throat> if you are talking about uh, an online or, or digital or, or social sort of social media experience, you need very, very different measures. And, and the same is true, of course, for the, for, for the user experience that you, or, or the actual customer experience that you may have in a store in a, in, in a retail environment. But I want to look at broader measures because ultimately <clears throat> the success of your uh, experience project depends on whether customers are satisfied. So customer satisfaction or what is nowadays called customer delight is, is an absolute key measure. And customer delight goes way beyond just being satisfied, meaning confirming you know, your customer's expectations. It's about creating surprise elements. So you want to ask, for example, you know, to what degree do we, do we surprise you? To what degree do we delight you? Uh, whenever we are interacting with you. Uh, another key measure I think is, and that is another outcome that we want from a, from a CX project is repeat purchase and loyalty. Um, so we need to do on an ongoing basis, you know, our, our customers coming back, we need to do that sort of important tracking. And also with respect to, to the brand, is the brand truly loved? Is the brand, you know, are people attached to that particular brand? So there are these various general measures that need to be linked as part of a broad-based measuring measuring system where you look at the individual components of the experience and the ultimate outcomes with respect to customer satisfaction and delight and repeat purchase and loyalty and and and, and brand attachment and and mark has already mentioned uh, how important data are nowadays and also when we are when we are designing let's say measurements i think we also need to use the latest digital technologies so for any measure that i mentioned just now you know what just go to chat gpt Right, and they will tell you what these <laughs> things mean. They will tell you what the ideal measures are. Uh, you might even collect data through it. You can analyze them through their advanced uh, analysis tool. So I think it's easier and easier actually uh, to do a measurement and 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 then link your your strategies and your objectives as part of your CX project uh, to these uh, key performance indicators to to these KPIs. Okay, yeah, that, that that's clear. And Marcus, do you, do you want to build on that a bit? Maybe? Absolutely. Agree with everything Burns said. Um, but let me add something, and that's already been tapped uh, into by Ozioma here in the chat. Is it possible to be too fixated on the tech? I think that's true. I've seen, and Burn mentioned ChatGPT, chat GPT. A lot of people are excited right now about ChatGPT, and that's an amazing tech, right? That's as, as, as amazing and as magical as it gets. Um, but I think the most effective way to really measure uh, the quality of an experience is to ask people very simply, how does this make you feel? How did that make you feel? So analyzing emotions, analyzing sentiments, that is something that we are in a position to do these days very effectively, uh, very easily, in fact, uh, through the data that we sort of uh, uh, generate through uh, customer touch points and interactions that we have with customers. So how does something make you feel? The complex world of emotions and feelings and how, you know, technologies such as ChatGPT are indeed actually way less about, you know, the brilliance of an algorithm and a lot more about how, you know, a technology can make us feel. That I think is very important. And that, in my opinion, is one of those KPIs that companies um, um, are, are paying attention to increasingly. Yeah, there's a lot of interest in this uh, topic. I also just uh, checked the chat. 
and uh, NPS is being mentioned, Net Promoter mm -hmm. Score, uh, a word of mouth, clearly very, very important in the world of uh, uh, digital marketing and, uh, and and social influence and, and, and social influencers and those sorts of uh, um, um, uh, that sort of space. Uh, so yes, measurement key a key issue in uh, in in experience design. And and Marcus, we we also receive quite a lot of questions around how you leverage AI. You know, AI is everywhere um, in the conversation today for for good reason. But could you talk a, a bit about this in relation to customer experience? Absolutely. Uh, a lot of companies are very very excited about AI right now, uh, and they're approaching AI predominantly through a capabilities-based lens. You know, AI has certain cap capabilities like forecasting and listening and predicting and um, interacting and, and producing values. And that's great. But if we leave this kind of uh, interest in the hands of, of software engineers and programmers too much, I'm afraid the, the, the fact that each of these capabilities then translates into a specific customer experience or has to be translated into specific customer experience gets lost easily. Um, we did some research with a, a few colleagues on uh, the consumer experience of artificial intelligence. And what we found is that it has surprisingly little to do with the actual capabilities and way more with how each capability then translates into an experience. So uh, listening translates into feelings of understood, hopefully, and feelings of being misunderstood. And that as you can tell already, is a tension that we as marketers have to kind of design around and avoid design flaws. So sometimes, you know, algorithms misunderstand us and that can lead to problems. So I think the step from AI capabilities to experiences is an important one. It's not an easy one. And I think there's a lot of sort of skill that goes into translating a capability into an experience. Overall, I would say, um, Experiences are greater than the sum of their parts. There are four different experiences that we found. And uh, if we have time today, I can unpack them or maybe we do that in April. I think let's do that in April. We want to cover quite a lot of ground today. So that's okay. a, a good teaser for, for people that want to hear, hear more, I think. Um, before we, I, I want to make sure we, we have some time to shift to, to some more of the questions that have been coming in, um, you know, during the, the session already. But um, when we reviewed questions that were pre-submitted, there was also a, a bunch of them that concerned organizational issues, really. Um, and Bernd, maybe you could talk about which departments in an organization need to or should engage on the CX. And what is the best way for a, a company to to think about or organize their customer experience? Yeah, I mean, which department? Uh, it depends on the organization. And I'm not even sure you want to have one particular department being in charge of it, like whatever mm. marketing. Um, I think in a way, CX is everybody's job. Uh, it, it goes all the way down to, uh, you know, the interactivity that you have with your customers. So if you're on a sales call, well, uh, whoever is in the sales call provides the experience. When you're in a store, uh, you know, the salesperson provides the experience. And I'm talking about a physical store. If you are a, a social influencer, okay, the experience is provided by you when you're doing your broadcast, so to speak. So, so everybody's job is the customer experience. And as a result, within an organization, a lot of different departments are being touched by it. And traditionally, Customer experience was always looked at some design or, or, or branding or communication issue. I think that has entirely changed. It's now a lot of interactivity that is needed with, with technology departments and, and innovation teams as well. And, and it's not only about um, people that work on AI. It's also all sorts of other new technologies that could improve the customer experience or change it. Take something like the metaverse that's being discussed or or you know, Apple Vision Pro is being launched next year by by, by Apple, right? So uh, that can create new experiences. Um, so, so so there's a whole technology space coming that is entirely changing how people will be interacting uh, with companies at various touch points, and and thus companies internally really need to uh, have departments that deal with those technologies being involved as part of the customer experience. Okay. Yeah, clear. Thank you. And Marcus, maybe you could share some thoughts on, on this as well. I absolutely agree. Um, customer experience design is an organizational mindset. This is something that you have to really kind of breathe and live and experience on a daily basis within an organization. There are many examples of companies that do that extremely well. One of my favorite examples of late is Yeti. 
Yeti lives in an, in an again, very competitive space, uh, outdoor adventure goods. And, you know, when you look at how uh, representatives of Yeti sort of like embody the experience of Yeti publicly on LinkedIn, on social, in their personal interactions, they actually love the experience. And I think that's the key to, uh, to uh, experience design success, that the architects in charge of designing your experience are actually already convinced, already transformed, already delighted. And that kind of employee experience, I think, is the key um, to uh, succeeding in terms of customer experience design more broadly. But there is another factor here, and Bernd was hinting at that, uh, technologies are experienced design actors or designers as well. You know, an algorithm today um, can make or break your experience design. And algorithms, as we all know, have a life and will of their own. So we need to train them properly. Uh, how we train algorithms is, is uh, an important aspect of how customer experience design actually happens within organizations. So if you give that training task away, you run the risk of sort of letting your experience be trained, be shaped by actors who might not be 100% convinced and who might not be a sort of in line with your values and 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 your purpose. So keep in mind that, you know, it's, it's a broad-based kind of approach, I think, that we need, one that em, em, embraces technology and also one that kind of goes beyond the, the, the boundaries of an organization. You know, competitors, policymakers, uh, media journalists, medical experts in some cases, or expert, domain experts, these are all customer experience designers that have an impact on driving, shaping, and maybe also constraining your experience design success. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that. So if you two are up for this now, I'd like to sort of fire some of the questions at you that have been coming in sort of uh, live, so to speak. So um, they go in some different directions, but Vishroot um, has asked, is there a difference between B2C customer experience, CX, and, and B2B CX? And if so, what is that? And how do you think about that? And what does it, what does it mean, really? Yeah, I mean, there is a not so much of a difference in the in the strategy that you need and in the customer centricity. Obviously, the customers in, in B2B are not individual consumers, but they're other companies. You need to understand you know, how they run their business and how you can add value to their business. And, and in terms of the strategy, there may be slightly different strategy components, but the biggest difference is really in the implementation. It's in the touch points, right? Uh, I mean, for B2B, you go to trade shows or you have online meetings about about your business so so those are the key customer experience and then ultimately the delivery of the product how you are how you are uh, how the customer first you know interacts with the product understands it and so on or the service uh, so it's really more the touch points but the the framework the thinking the mindset that Marcus was talking about is is relevant really for both uh, b2c as well as b2b Thank you for that. I, maybe maybe if I can add to this really quickly, this is yeah. I love this question. It's it's a very popular question. And I've worked with a lot of B2B companies and B2C companies. And I, I want to add two really important things. Number one, there's always a consumer somewhere. But um the, the second thing that I want to say, and I'm sorry for the symbolism that appears here on my screen. Uh the second thing I want to say is that uh <laughs> and now I'm frozen. Well, that um, was an awesome comment. That's why you get the thumbs up. Mark. Yeah, I don't know what's happening here with the video. Let me turn it back on. Okay. Oh, no, I'm back. Okay. So the other thing I wanted to say is that, and I was talking about the difference between capabilities and experiences. Here's the thing with B2B. In the context of B2B, the capabilities are very often your experience. It's like a direct translation. You're dealing with domain experts. You're dealing, the competitive landscape is shaped and driven. The competitive game is, is shaped around capability experiences, as we might call them. So that I think is an important difference, but I also agree with Bernd that, you know, in the end, it's it's probably a, a very similar uh, a design exercise. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you for, for your thoughts on that. Um, a question is coming from Patricia who works in the optical segment, um, but she asks, how can we create the same great experience that is offered in person, but in a digital environment and is that even possible? That's her, her reflection. And it's the optical. Do we have any more details? No, we don't. But I think you can take it as a general question, really, but around, you know, if you, you're kind of a traditional business, um, how do you take 
and you've invested a lot in what you believe is a strong and compelling customer experience. Can you move that smoothly into the digital environment? And what are some of the, the challenges or ways of doing that? Well, the challenges are in the digital environment. And I guess we, we mean like, for example, online or, or, or social media and so on. Yeah. Um, you, you are missing some of the, uh, how should I say this? Some of the haptic, the tactability, the, the, the sort of environmental components that you may have in a, in a, in a physical selling space. And uh, I think there is hope because uh, there's more and more of that. Um, I mentioned Apple Vision Pro. So mm -hmm. if that becomes a reality, well, there may be very uh, easy ways to do that so that you can uh, envision the, the product also in a, in a, in a digital setting. Uh, so I think that is it. When you're looking at some companies that started out purely digitally, they often nowadays need a, 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 a retail space. Uh, Warby Parker is the classic example. There are numerous other ones. Uh, and I think similarly, uh, you, of course, need a strong digital presence that also is experiential in nature when you have uh, some sort of physical selling point. So it's really about bringing the two together and again, creating this integration that we uh, said is a key component of, of uh, experience uh, experience design. Great. Th th thank you, Bernd. Um, I've got a question from Salvador. Um, this may be the last one. We'll see how long it takes you to, to sort of tackle this one, but either the, the last or last but one. But um, he says, is there research or do you have any thoughts or insights about whether customers prefer or resent dealing with um, chatbots, technology, robots you mentioned in hotels, in, in some of the, the, the mm. Asian hotels that you stayed in recently, Bernd. But do you have any kind of um, insights or thoughts around people's reaction to right. being dealt with by technology in some way like that? Yeah, maybe I can take that question because I've actually done a lot of research on, on robots. And uh, uh, there's a popular theory that we have in academia and that's also been picked up by, by journalists. Each time they write about robots, they talk about the uncanny valley. Right, the idea that when, uh, let's say, a a a chatbot or if an embodied AI, a robot gets too close to looking human, that could actually backfire. People feel eerie; they feel sort of freaked out. Uh, and, and indeed, that seems to be the case. There's it's quite some uh, empirical evidence in in academic research about the uh, uncanny uncanny valley. Um, and 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 there's also seem to be interestingly enough cross-cultural differences, when you go to Asia, it is more accepted and, and you get uh, more and more of these humanoid robots that look extremely uh, human-like, whereas in, in, in the US and in the Western world, it seems uh, we really want to know this is, this is just a, this is just a, a robot, it's not a human. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, there's research on that. And uh, I think we are learning more and more. And also as pe people become more and more familiar with AI systems in general, and also with embodied AI, uh, we may get some level of familiarity and people may be more acceptable of what they are currently uh, sort of resisting. A quick comment on this. I, I want to add really, which I think is important because uh, Bern mentions there's a great deal of innovation and a great deal of learning. And I think that's important to remember that customer experience design is a way to which to make consumers learn on how to properly interact with a non-human technology such as an AI chatbot. So we're currently part of a large scale learning process. And I think the companies that will competitively succeed and make the race here are those that understand that CX is a way to make consumers learn how to interact with these technologies differently from what it means to interact with humans. Okay, thank you, Marcus. I think on that note, that's a great point for us to, to wrap up. It's gone super fast. As always, really a big thank you from me to you both for spending some time with us and for sharing your knowledge and insights uh, during a you know, fast and furious session. So appreciate that a lot. Um, we're really looking forward to your upcoming design, designing customer experiences from a strategy to execution program, which is brand new and taking place this April um, in person on our fantastic Manhattanville campus, but also more broadly a bit in New York, if I understand correctly, mm -hmm. taking participants out into the real world as well. So that that's uh, uh, an exciting new program for us all. And to the participants on, on this session, please do keep an eye open for more information about the program that um, Bernd and Marcus will be running. We'd really love for you to join us on campus and just to keep on learning with us. That's why we're we're here. Um, on behalf of Columbia Business School Exec Ed, I'd really like to thank you all for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the session and have a, a great rest of your day. Thank you. 
Thanks, Mark. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.